possibly catapult here today. Um, really looking forward to the conversations we're going to have and to find out what everybody's doing throughout the different industries involved with creating virtual worlds. Um, so to begin with, um, we're going to have uh, I'm going to talk and tell you a bit about the catapult, and then we've got some speaker slots uh, so for people to present what their businesses are doing. Um, that will run until about lunchtime, have a break, some networking, and then in the afternoon we're going to uh, run some workshops together to identify and go through some of the barriers that we've identified or potential areas of opportunity so we can share our thoughts and ideas, bring those together at the end of the day, and then identify some ways forward for us to, uh, to, to work together collaboratively, identify funding sources, and develop new products or create new business relationships. So, um, a little bit about the, a little bit about the catapults. Um, so, uh, this is out of date already. Um, there are now 11 catapults. Um, and I'll just read off the different areas if they're of interest to you. So we've got cell and gene therapy, compound semiconductor applications, digital uh, energy systems, food systems, high value manufacturing, medicines discovery, offshore renewables energy, receiver, precision medicine, cell applications, and transport systems. Um, so they're spread across the UK and um, we are various centres of excellence, um, bring together technology and people. Um, so our ultimate goal is to create world-leading uh, centres uh, designed to transform the UK's capabilities for innovation in specific areas and drive, uh, help drive future economic growth. Uh, there are a series of physical centres um, where we can bring together businesses, we have incubators, we have the very latest hardware and technology, technologists to run that technology, um, engineers, scientists, hopefully everything you need in a particular field or under one roof. Uh, along with data sets and, and, and networking uh, uh, capabilities. And uh, the, the, the purpose of the catapult, um, the catapults, are um, to try and catapult quite literally technologies from immature, um, uh, immature ideas, concepts, or individual technologies which aren't, don't form part of a business case or could be better implemented into a system and move their maturity through from early onset ideas through to more mature ideas. So um, Catapult is a non-profit, uh, independent, so we, we, we're not here to do anything more than to drive economic growth and business growth. One of our key remits for, for success is creating jobs in the UK. Um, and uh, as I said here, we're trying to um, bring universities and industry close together. This is often, this, on this diagram to refer to the innovation phase, uh, traditionally in the UK, this is the valley of death. Like great ideas never get the chance to get to this point. So the catapults are here to engage with academia, understand what great new ideas are out there at very early, like early stages, what industry wants, and then to find sources of funding and partnerships in this space to accelerate ideas up this to the right hand side, and then to entice industry to start spending research money earlier on in the, in the, in the maturity phase to bring those two together. Well, if you've got any questions during this presentation, feel free to, to put your hand up and quite happy to answer questions. Um, so specifically talking about the transport systems catapult, uh, you may have seen the last Pathfinder has been a bit of a, uh, a shining beacon project, very uh, high profile, um, where we're trying to work, uh, we've been working with uh, RDM who make prototype vehicles um, and now looking very closely at autonomous vehicles and uh, Oxbotica, which are a spin out of Oxford University, do the autonomous control systems and see how we can use, uh, combine those technologies and bring together industry to look at how we autonomous vehicles might operate on pedestrianised areas. So unlike a lot of other companies out there looking at road-based autonomy, uh, looking at the challenges that us pink squidgy things, so humans I prefer to pink squidgy things, or uh, well, the challenges that we cause with autonomous vehicles because we're inherently unpredictable, um, everybody's different, everybody can be distracted easily, mobile phones cause a lot of interesting uh, walking behaviours, um, and how that all, uh, uh, how the environment also affects um, those vehicles' ability to make reasonable progress. Um, so the catapult here, we have uh, five business units. So the auto auto automated transport systems, anything autonomous from ground-based to, to air-based to, to sea-based. Uh, smart asset management, looking at logistics technologies. Um, customer experience team, who are a uh, group of psychologists and human factors people, looking very much at service offerings and how to optimise products and, and services to make them attractive to the end customer. Um, and then we have the modelling and visualisation team, which I'm part of, uh, and our team, the visualisation team, is uh, organising today. 
and then the information exploitation, um, anything to do with data, processing, analysis, um, AI, um, and they have a, we're trying to build, I think, getting quite close to building the largest database of transport-related data. Um, I'm saying data, it's a sort of library, so if we don't have that data, we know what data's out there, so the idea with all the catapults that we are is uh, a, a very good starting place for anybody looking to work in the transport industry to understand who the players are, what the data are, what data is there, what technologies are there, and, time, and how it can be fused together. Um, and uh, the catapults, well, the, the transport catapults remit um, is all about enabling access to uh, intelligent mobility. Um, now, three years ago when we formed, the analysis indicated that uh, the market in intelligent mobility, which I'll describe in a second, um, is going to be 900 billion per year by 2025, and our remit is to help businesses to take 10% of that market potential. Um, and we want to help create an environment that will make the UK world leader in this field, um, particularly in transport systems innovation. Um, so in terms, in terms of mobility, we define as the smarter, greener, more efficient movements of people and goods around the world. And we're looking to create a different approach to transport challenges, to think about things differently because we're not uh, under the same pressure to deliver as people out there delivering services and transportation. We have that, that freedom to think, to see opportunities and bring people together. So we want to try and create some joined up thinking, um, identify and bringing capability and business together, as we're trying to do today, I hope we have done today, um, and uh, addressing also some of the, uh, the wider societal changes and challenges out there. So thinking about population growth, how do we um, build systems that account for the obvious increase in, in population, the aging population, how we uh, possibly align uh, identify technologies which help to contribute to reducing our, our CO2 emissions um, and, uh, um, and what energy, so energy sources uh, will be prolific in, in, in transport systems in the future. So um, from our going activity point of view, um, we're developing the opportunities with emerging technologies and see how they can be part in terms of mobility. Um, we are helping and working with various, on various projects, like autonomous vehicles. Um, we are looking at, um, well, particularly modeling visualization team, we're looking at uh, new and exciting ways to simulate environments and, and transportation, which is the theme of today. Um, and uh, we're looking at customer-centric offerings, uh, commercial opportunities, and how we continue to travel. So this is very much the customer experience side of things. You know, what are the current pain points in a journey? How, how do we make it seamless to move from mode to mode of transport? Where, where are the travel areas? How, how can we improve those to make your journey um, that, that ideal uh, vision of, of you, you step out your door and you, uh, a mode of transport meets you and then you don't think about it until you literally arrive at your destination? Um, and maybe link up your calendar and all those kind of things. Um, and how, most importantly, can we make better use of the existing infrastructure that is out there? As we all know, transport is incredibly expensive to change. Um, I mean, we can't remember what the current tally is for HS2, but it's, it's big, big investment. So what small improvements can we make to what we have already to help us improve, increase capability and allow us to, 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 to have that capacity going into the future? Uh, so just as an idea, some of the uh, collaborative partners that we work with and, and funding sources that we um, currently um, working with and, and applying applicate and making applications into the partners. Um, and um, as I mentioned, we work back in the academia. So we currently have a um, university partnership program, um, which has got I think, about 15 or 16 universities um, associated with it. But that's going to be refreshed in the next six months to open up to all universities. And um, recognize that um, there are opportunities in, in other industries and, and cross fertilization, um, which, um, you know, if we don't open up everybody, it makes it, makes it difficult to get that, that benefit from everybody being involved. Um, so that's coming soon. Um, so the visualization team are based in the, the lab, which is just to your left hand side. Um, just at the end of lunch, we'll be opening up the lab for people to come and have a look and have a chat um, just before the workshops. So if you haven't experienced VR, you're interested to see some of the projects we're doing, which I'll describe briefly. Um, then by all means, um, eat quickly and come upstairs and they might get a chance to try on some of the kit we've got. Um, but essentially the, the lab uh, and our capability was, was uh, finished or actually started maybe in June when the lab was completed um, and we're a collection of uh, human factors, uh, Unity programmers, 3D modelers, GIS and um, uh, media and 360 video guys. So we're trying to cover all the bases and the new immersive technologies 
and to identify how these could be used in transport. So it's very, an open, very much an open innovation um, environment where we, we're here to educate anybody coming through the doors and to help people identify how they could use the technology and then to help them more identify SMEs in the market that could assist them in doing what they want to do. So this is the, the first of its kind in, um, in the UK particularly, but um, it's, it's the first time all this technology brought together and is literally open to anybody to come in, access and use and learn about. Um, and uh, we're primarily focusing on um, having one place to come for all the knowledge, the hardware, um, and to try and look at how we can create more multi-sensory experiences in virtual reality. If anybody has tried VR out, it's, you know, most people get freaked out, they look down, they don't see their body, and their hands aren't present. Um, and the sound isn't there. You know, it's, it's, it's how, how many senses can we trick? Can we actually look on behalf of people interested in VR to see what the beneficial uh, things are to try and try and recreate? You know, you know, what's the cost benefit? Um, and then advise people so that you're not spending lots of money and time buying a kit, building the expertise to realize actually it doesn't do what you wanted to do. So I think going to save you time money by spending a little bit, a little bit of public money. Um, and uh, the facility and the whole of this catapult is, is a, a space of stakeholders and interested parties to come together and talk, create new ideas, new business opportunities. Um, so I said, to inform, to educate, to help. Show technology, um, run workshops, identify opportunities, and help um, SMEs and larger companies to find funding sources that will allow them to de-risk the ideas they've got and accelerate, accelerate their pace towards market. Um, and one of the key objectives is enabling decision makers to make better informed decisions. So we believe through immersive technologies we have the ability to place people in a first person perspective into worlds that they otherwise wouldn't have seen until the final thing was finished. Or you know, looking at a two dimensional image from a single viewpoint is not really going to give you a contextual understanding of what is being proposed. And that not only helps decision makers and key stakeholders, but also potentially can help with engaging with the public to get them on board very early on. I think there's about a thousand uh, issues, uh, complaints raised with the HS2, just as an example, I'm not picking on HS2. Um, but because of the scale of it, a number of people who feel they're going to be disrupted by it, there's going to be a whole load of um, uh, actions which are going to be, um, need, need, need to be discussed and resolved. So one of the, one of the ideas that we're very really keen on, and I think some people already worked on this in the room, is um, um, if we can engage more effectively, then we can um, potentially resolve some of these issues before they become major issues. Um, I'm going to skip this video because I'm getting a stick on the back. I'm, I've got two minutes. Okay, thank you. Um, so, as an, as an example here, I will show the video. Um, this is a, a, an event we ran with a company called, I think it's my favourite company's title so far, Elephants Can't Jump. I don't know if you've heard of them. Um, but they're a, a brand design and marketing company. And um, they, they've never seen VR before, but. Um, through various conversations with individuals, they decided to bring their whole creative team to the catapult um, to understand what VR could potentially do from a marketing point of view and a communication point of view. Uh, occasionally, we do have to show them games because games are just you know they're more exciting and but they, they really push them out because the guys in the gaming industry have done a lot more than in other industries. Um, but it starts to show some of the haptics and the 3D sound, um, uh, uh, you know, more sensory immersive experiences there are out there. We did show them some serious stuff as well, by the way, but it's not all fun, but um, yeah, we're, we're looking towards the industry, for, to the gaming industry and the military industries who have been working on VR for a lot longer than, than other, the transport sector has, and then taking those ideas and trying to see how they can apply to transport. Um, so here's a very brief uh, uh, description of some of the technology we've got. Um, we've just gone for impressive to buying some new kits, and we're actually twinning up with additional catapults in London, so we can start to look at distance communication, uh, multi-person experiences in VR to look at potential for collaboration, uh, looking at uh, design reviews, wayfinding, just um, having conference calls uh, potentially to save people travelling, because that's the link to travel. Um, if we can allow people to engage with 3D models in a more engaging way using VR, and they can do that from their offices, then they don't have to travel, so that will save business miles, CO2, uh, allow better understanding um, without having to travel. And see something face to face. Uh, and currently, the most obvious thing in the lab is the Omni Deck. So, one of my backgrounds in human factors, and um, a, lot of, a lot of this technology relies on people understanding gaming and being familiar with game pads. A lot, of, a lot of the people we want to try and engage with don't appreciate, don't play games. So, how can we remove any barriers that might exist due to the peripherals you need to engage with immersive environments? 
And this is um, this is a, a holodeck of the 21st century, if you want to call it that. Um, by placing yourself in the middle of this deck and you're walking out to the outside, um, you can explore vast environments without ever leaving the confines of the room or bumping into the wall. So the rollers go in that direction, you walk forward, and you can explore with complete freedom. We've had over 150 people who have had no training arrive here, go on the army deck, walk around our virtual Milton King's prototype. And nobody's been motion sick, nobody's fallen over, and everybody, after a few minutes, starts to let themselves go and just wander and explore. And it, is, it seems really trivial, but it's these little tiny incremental things that really make these immersive experiences more valuable and more insightful. So that's one of the things uh, we're looking at, which is quite important. Um, and very briefly, because I am out of time, um, so we're looking at my background human factors that have done a lot of user trials in the past. Um, and I've been limited by what I can get hold of um, physically or what can, I can get prototypes. Um, with some of the last engineers to do that. So what VR, I believe, helps us to do is to be able to run user trials in VR so we can take customers, put them into these virtual environments before you've committed to anything and get them to review that. And we started to build in uh, biometric sensing so we can look at heart rate, respiration, skin tension, eye tracking and start to collect objective data during user trials to try and provide evidence towards different choices that might be available to, to the engineering company. Um, and I don't have to. Oh, that was it. Perfect. Okay, so I hope you have a good day. Um, I'm really excited to hear what you guys are up to and, and having a good chat later on. And uh, over to the first presenter, which I think is Mantle. Future cities. Future cities.